Is that better? Oh, much better. <laughs> All right. So, I'm Jeff Beck. I'm a software architect at SmartThings. I spend my time uh, volunteering with Rat Pack as well. I'm one of the contributors there, and I do a lot of uh, microservices at work. So I have a lot of experience with a lot of different frameworks, and I thought it'd be really interesting to kind of compare and contrast to give people a good sense of the differences between them. So I want to jump right in. Uh, I kind of wanted to level set with an introduction to what Grails is kind of based on. It's a convention over configuration, as everyone's probably heard. Uh, Spring Boot based. It's servlet oriented. It doesn't directly call it out, but that's still right now what's going on under the covers. And GORM is built in well. And this is just the current state of things. This is not the future state. There's a lot of coming in all of these technologies that could change a lot of these statements. So this is just today. So what this actually means, uh, you're going to have a standard project layout. So pretty much all your Rails projects are going to be have the same structure. You have domain folders, controller folders, things like that. Uh, we have a powerful configuration tooling that's coming out of the box. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, a relatively easy to approach programming paradigm in that uh, it's servlet oriented, things like that. It's, it's well known in the industry. And we have a lot of Spring Boot interoperability, which is nice. And the power of GORM, which I think is a great, great thing for Grails. So Rat Pack. It's a minimal framework. It's designed to stay out of your way. It's netty based, not serverly oriented, and it has its own execution model. So what this actually means, though, is Rat Pack stays unopinionated. By being a minimalist framework, it's trying to not make choices for you. You can use Juice or Spring for dependency injection. The one thing it does force on you, though, because of Netty and everything, is you have to write asynchronous non-blocking code. Rat Pack makes that a little easier, a little more approachable, but that's just the one thing you're opting into with Rat Pack. Um, Rat Pack also wants to manage execution because if you're doing asynchronous non-blocking, Rat Pack's going to manage those threads for you. And then Netty's under the covers, which is highly performant. It's just a really great framework. And that's the main thing that originally drew me to the project was Netty because of how much I enjoy it. So, so this whole talk is based around the fact that we're going to build a service twice. And it's going to be response. So I kind of wanted to set some business idea of what it actually does. So it's going to be responsible for tracking a hub. And I work at a smart IoT company, so a hub is an actual physical thing in your house. And we're going to see whether or not it's claimed, where it's connected, and knows about some manufacturing. Now, the reason those things are important is that we know data is going to come in from different places, and we know a few other things going on, and we want to track some of that data. So the basic setup. We're going to use Gradle to manage both builds, and we're going to set this up as a multi-project build. So why don't we go ahead and show what that actually looks like. So you'll see on this side, we have, I've been very creative and named my two sub-projects, Grails and Rat Pack. So we, what I've done is set up uh, the two includes to get a multi-project build going. And then you'll see the different basics. And what I've done is I've generated the Hello World with Lazy Bones for Rat Pack and the just Grails create app with default profile to start for Grails. So let's go ahead and do run app. We'll start the interactive prompt. While that's starting, we'll start the Rat Pack run. So these are just the Hello World projects. All right, so Rat Pack's up and running. Grails is up and running. If we go back. We'll see what we get out of the box for both of these projects. 
There's our default Gradle Grails. And then Rat Pack is 50-50. Very simple. So if we look at the actual code, what we'll get for Grails is some basic configuration out of the box. This is kind of all templated out for you as part of your profiles. You'll get your URL mappings set up for you, just your basics. And you have a lot of this nice folder structure that's always the same. Now, if we go and look at the Rat Pack, what we'll see is we do get this other folder called Rat Pack Main that happens to have um, a Rat Pack Groovy. And this is the standard, for, this is all that's standard in the format. Uh, Rat Pack knows how to look this file up if it's in this folder, but you can move it and you can give it a little more configuration if you want. So this is where we're actually doing both kind of our URL mapping a little bit as well as uh, what we're actually going to render out. So we have this like index page, some titles. That's the basics. So the next step, let's add a hub stats stub. So the way I like to build most of my projects is I'll build out a endpoint that has the stubbed data so I can start seeing it, consuming it, even if it's just canned, and then start building the functionality behind the scenes. So we want to serve traffic on slash hubs slash stats. This is where I'm going to cheat and check it out. So let's start with the Grails Act. So we've added a very simple controller that you can't see because it's small. Better? All right. If it's ever small, just shout. All right, so this is a very simple stubbed out, and now we need to declare the special route that we want. So we're going to actually just, in the mappings, tell it that slash hub slash stats is always going to go to that controller and that action. Now, when we want to do the same thing in Rat Pack, we're actually going to, in the handler chain, that's this right here, we're going to say, for any git, make this path. And then it's pretty easy for us to uh, write that map. You'll notice, though, we don't have the as JSON or anything like that. So we're just going to use the Jackson object mapper, which is available to us, and we're going to inject it into the handler right there. So, so far, these services are similar, but you'll notice one of the main differences is URL mappings versus the handler chain. So, Grails has uh, this URL mappings report, which is, I think, just really great. So, while that runs, the idea is that you're able to see this entire list of all of your routes. Eventually. There we go. So you can see that we have our controller for our hub stats. It's always bound. And we can see all our dynamic mappings as well. This is one of the areas that you're not going to have in Rat Pack. The way Rat Pack uses handlers in the chain is the routing is always going to be dependent on the actions you take in the handlers. So you can change dynamically, based on data that's coming in, what kind of routing you're doing, opposed to having these upfront static routing that's always defined. Even if you have dynamic routing in Grails, it's set up at the beginning, which is really powerful. And you can do these really nice URL mappings. It's pretty nice for maintainability as well. But there's certain bits of flexibility you can't do. And Rat Pack allows you to mix some of the routing logic on the handler with some of the return logic in order to know additional processing or things like that you want to do. But that's one of the like, first like, major differences you're going to notice. 
Any questions about handlers versus URL mapping so far? So in general, we need to store data because it's a service. We, want to, we care about where the hubs are. That's what we said. And also, most services store data, or they just do a lot of proxy routing. And if we're storing data, let's start with a relational database because that's a great place to start with many services before you move to non-relational or whatever else you're doing. And Grails has Gorum. You have deep support for this, and you also have domains. So you know very easily how to quickly create a storage uh, for your object. So since they're built deeply in, you get a lot of functionality from just your, your ORM layer built into the rest of the framework. So you're able to do some very, uh, like at resource is a great way to like automatically wire up everything else you want to do with your framework. So Rat Pack, on the other hand, it has an, about three modules right now that have to do with uh, databases, uh, relational databases. You have Hikari, H2, and JDBC transactions. But these are just really low level components to work with. You have a connection pool, you have eight, an in-memory database for testing, and you have a, tran a transaction tool. You can build a lot of functionality with this, but you're going to be building it all yourself. So what you'll see many times is people just using raw SQL directly in a lot of these services. And that's fine. It's lightweight. A lot of people like the direct control over this SQL. But you're doing a lot of this stuff potentially by hand, opposed to using an ORM or something like that. And there's a lot of trade-offs there. Sometimes an ORM is a great option. Sometimes it's a lot nicer to write detailed SQL. There's quite a few more options with Ratpack. You can actually use Gorm with Ratpack if you'd like. It's a little more set up. It's not as out of the box as it is with Grails, of course. And if you're using Gorm, and why not use all of the, these deep, uh, great tie-ins with Grails? You can use Juke. Is everyone familiar with Juke? Or? OK, so Juke is a code generation tool. And you end up writing your, you're able to write statically typed SQL commands. You end up generating code from your schemas. And then that gives you the statically typed way to interact with your MySQL. So you have, oh, not my, your SQL. So you have real SQL under the covers that you can work with if you need to. But the static generation works really well. And there's quite a few articles, if you search for Rat Pack and Juke, about people using that and using it well. Uh, the other area that is out there is provided as module is Liquibase. So one thing you'll notice about Rat Pack is there's not plugins. It's modules, it's libraries. And the main thing is that they're out there, and they're relatively easy to find, and they just import like any standard compile job. So you'll see, uh, if you search, you'll see a number of random Rat Pack modules provided by SmartThings, the company I work for. We try to open source things as we come across them. Uh, things like this are relatively small, but we tend to make them libraries so that they're easier to reuse, where you could implement this yourself pretty quickly. But why bother re-implementing it over and over again? That's what we found when we launched 30 to 40 microservices in a short period of time. So I do want to point out, though, read-only uh, databases become very important. So if you're using RDS, like an AWS hosted service, and have read replicas, you very much want to force as much as your read traffic to the read replicas. And in Gorham and Grails, you can do that with annotations for uh, read-only transaction or forcing a new transaction to be read-only. And you can do some nice things there. It's a little bit harder in Rat Pack, potentially, depending on what framework you're using. If you're using Juke, for example, there's, not a, there's actually not a built-in way to set read-only on any transactions. So we ended up. Uh, in the code, I'll sh in a little bit, I'll show you what we actually do 
which is relatively small, but it's something that's not built in anywhere yet. So before we can actually put in anything in the database, we actually need to parse or data bind it, depending on which, you're, which framework you're looking at. So there's two different uh, terminologies going on. Grails is going to be using data binding. Rat Pack tends to use the word parse. Basically, they are doing the same thing. So going into the request and puts it into the params object, basically. This then processes through data binding, and you can get command objects or controller arguments. Um, most people at this, most people that I work with at this point are using command objects. They're not really doing controller arguments anymore, and most people don't use the params directly uh, in the f use cases we're doing. If you want to parse an unsupported media type, you can do that by implementing the data binding source creator. And there's a nice little guide that gives you a lot of details of how to actually do that. But it is kind of deep in there that you may not have run into. If you're just doing XML and JSON, it's all supported out of the box. If you're doing like protobufs or some more advanced media types, that's when you might need to implement your own. So on the Rat Pack side of things, you only operate on the body for parsing. You don't actually ever operate on query params. Query params and uh, arguments, and by default, when you call parse, it's going to use the JSON parser if it's JSON in the body, and it actually only operates on the body. Uh, the other thing to note is you're going to get a promise back in Rat Pack. So you don't actually read the body until something has consumed that parsed object. So because we lazily load the body, if you happen to detect an error case because of a, something else, you'll never parse the body. You'll never even read the body in, which is more, a little more performant. It works better for Netty. There's less memory pressure. If you want to parse something custom, the interface is, you just need to implement an interface in Rat Pack. So it's similar to the implementation you do in Grails, except this one has to deal with the media types. So in Grails, you are saying what media types are supported by this parser. Uh, and it kind of works in a similar way in Rat Pack. But they're not registered to the, to the MIME types. So what ends up happening is you ha you're expected to return a null quickly in Rat Pack. So it's up to you to short circuit your parser to quickly say, no, I can't process this. And you can check the media type and things like that very easily. It's just, it's a little more raw. You have a little more control. You can, you can potentially do things a little faster. You could also potentially do things way worse and do a lot of attempts to try to parse things even if it doesn't have the right media type. So since the delegation isn't happening inside of Rat Pack, you could choose to say, if I don't see a media type, I'm going to go ahead and try anyway, and then potentially return the object if you could make it work. Whereas the media types are like bound to the data binding source creator, if I could say it correctly. All right. So we've quickly crashed through like databases and hand with them a little bit and actually talked a little bit about parsing. So now we can actually do something with all of that. This is where we should be able to bring together the database, create a basic CRUD interface for these hubs. So starting with Grails, what we're going to do is we're going to add a new domain. And that domain's our hub. It's pretty simple, not much to it. We're just going to keep it uh, relatively simple. And I'm going to use the resource annotation to give us the actual uh, CRUD operations. So with this, I now have my basic CRUD operations storing into H2. 
uh, without any other changes other than adding this domain, because this is everything that was built into Grails for you. So. Let's go ahead and stop. And then we're going to run the app to make sure. Ooh, we're going to kill that. <laughs> Interactive prompt got a little messed up, sorry. All right, so if we create a few posts, change a couple names. You'll now see that we've got a number of results returned from our list operation. And that all came just from that one block of code. If we, we should also be able to get at any one of these individually, which we can do. And that's all just given to us by this domain object and this annotation. You'll notice we didn't have to do any additional work in our URL mappings. That's all handled by the annotation. We have a little more work to do. You'll notice that we have added a number of new things in the bindings, and we've updated our uh, handler chain. So in order to get this all to work, we actually need to set up the database module, because none of that's going to be set up out of the gate for us. Uh, whereas with the profiles we used in Grails, everything's just set up and ready for us. With Ratpack, you're going to have to bring this stuff in. That's not that bad. Uh, so the module area up here is where we're actually going to configure these different modules as part of Ratpack. And we have our H2 set up, and we have just what driver source. The other items that I've added is a DAO service and a hubs endpoint. So the DAO service is exactly what it sounds like. It is a really simple service that I'm just using the SQL directly. Better? All right. So at this point, we have to, we are doing this create tables hack right here. Uh, in production, you would never do this, of course. And in general, uh, you'd want to use the liquid base or flyway kind of modules to do your database migrations. But that's another thing you have to pull in. So you have to do these things with Ratpack because they're just not getting it out of the box like you do with Gorm and Hibernate. Another key feature you'll notice is everywhere we're returning promises in Ratpack. Because Ratpack forces us to be asynchronous and non-blocking, all of this work that we're doing won't actually execute until someone's subscribed to it. data, like expecting to read that data. Because of that, if you have a known bug that always fails, you will get a consistent failure. You won't get sometimes it inserted and then failed, and sometimes it didn't insert and failed. You'll, it will always fail. But as we don't have an ORM, we have to do some simple mapping. That's all pretty standard. The main difference that we've now done is we've introduced a prefix. So for slash hubs, instead of doing this in the URL map, and we can jump right into the hubs endpoint. This is making another chain in here where we're saying, given a path by which we know is slash hubs, we're going to do the get the post 
uh, git and post because I didn't want to type it all so we don't have the update and delete, but you would follow a similar pattern. And we have our object mapper when doing a git, but what's more important is this parse in the post. So we're parsing the hub and we're always going to be asking for what type we want out. And then instead of immediately doing the then, I can flat map and that allows me to operate once it's subscribed to, I can operate on the data coming in. And so what I'm doing here is taking that hub that I parsed and saving it off into the DAO. And then I'm returning that back for further processing. And then we process what the return is with the then. And I'm just, right now I'm just rendering it straight back as, as JSON. You'll notice that there's a little bit of red up here. Every once in a while, uh, IntelliJ can't quite uh, figure out some of the things with the groovy DSL that we're doing. And so you get some of those. It's not bad. It's, you can just like, safely ignore it. If we run in the, so it's already running. So we can actually go and show. Back to post. And 50-50 for Rat Pack. You notice that we do get data back. It is working. We can do our git. We get an array back. So things are actually working, even though we have a little bit of red in IntelliJ. The other thing we've done is I've moved the the stat the path for slash hub slash stats into the hub's prefix, and now I can do just slash. St just stats in here and do my standard stats that I was working on before. So that allows me to keep all of the hub things together opposed to kind of having the routing interspersed. Whereas if you look in the URL mappings for the Grail side, we right now have one URL mapping there for slash hubs. And then we have to go and look in either the URL mapping report to see what other things are slash hub. And we should see that. I'll let that run in the background. Any questions on parsing and databases so far? All right. So you will see that we do have a full. Okay, apparently that's not going to work. Okay. You see that we, if we look in hub, we can see these hubs and we see all of these nice uh, paths that we get. So we can see all of them in the hub report, we just can't see them all in one place in the code. For rendering, Rails has the JSON view, the views with JSON views that are coming. Rat Pack has renderers. Uh, and they're expected to handle any format for a given type. So where a JSON view is focused on showing JSON for a particular type, the renderers in Rat Pack are intended to, for a particular type, like hub, render it every possible way. So our next step then is to actually say, let's just render IDs for our hub objects. So in the views, we now have a JSON view that is only putting the hub ID in the result. Once we've set up the JSON view like this, all of our requests into the Grail side. Oh, so sorry, I have to stop the. It doesn't always pick up the changes when I load from Git. It's, if you're just typing the changes, it should work fine. All right. 
nothing there, and then we slow. Now we're only getting IDs back, and the same thing for the post case. When we do a post, we're only getting the ID back as well. So we've, with just the JSON views, we're able to update all over the place. What we've done for Rat Pack is, since we're using Jackson, when this is just a uh, Pojo, go ahead and just use the standard Jackson annotations to affect how we're outputting. And that's normally what we're going to do for most cases. If you're just doing JSON, you're able to easily do ignore and property. So what's very interesting about Jackson is in order to make things settable but not readable, you actually have to make your getters and setters so that you can do the JSON ignore and JSON property in this current version. I hope they fix it, or I hope I missed something in the documentation, and there's a much easier way to do it. If anyone's got one, come see me. No, okay. <laughs> Someday. Uh, so that's where some of this is, I hope, starting to show. Rat Pack, this class right now is still reusable in other projects. There's nothing specific to Rat Pack in this kind of domain, domain model right now. So in many of our projects, we actually use publish all of these classes as their own artifact so that they can be reused with um, different projects for testing, things like that, where they're not tied directly to the framework. They just kind of stand on their own. There's one other, eh, if we have time, we'll go back to it. Uh, testing. This is another area you're going to see a major difference. You use Spock and Jeb with Rat Pack just as well as, as Grails, and how you, but how you actually think about it is where it gets very different. As everyone hopefully knows, there's Grails test phrases. Uh, that come out of the box with unit integration and functional. And Rat Pack doesn't actually have any phases at all. It only comes with whatever Gradle provides. So with unit tests, you're going to depend mostly on the mix-ins and mocking for testing your controllers and services and potentially standalone Java and Groovy classes. Uh, your integration tests will load up an application context so everything is wired and ready to go. Uh, and your functional tests are actually listening to an HTTP. While Grails testing, most tests that I've run across tend to be mostly unit, functional, which is kind of the normal progression a lot of times. But the main reason that we've found for running it in this order is because the tests tend to be much longer running. So it takes a lot more time to run the, the integration and the functional tests compared to the unit tests in Grails. Where in Rat Pack, most of the Rat Pack testing that the company I work for does is actually focused on the actual running apps in Rat Pack. So it's much faster to tear up, uh, set up and tear down Rat Pack apps. So you will see many times actually embedding an app inside of a test that will either act as a stub or even just you can use that same handler chain to only pick one particular component of your entire application that you're testing directly and that's the only thing you've wired up. So as part of this, there's this thing called application under test in Rat Pack. So when you're talking about a functional test in Grails, the entire app is running, and you can ask for what the server ports are bound to. In Rat Pack, we have the idea that the, the application under test will actually provide you with your test client that already knows what the ports are and everything like that and how it's set up. But you're also able to set up something called impositions that allows you to override certain parts 
for that test. That's very important, and one area that we I use it a ton is for auth. So we'll have an auth module that says, check this bearer token, and under our rep, our application on our test will have an imposition that replaces the token validation with a simple good token. If, if this is good token, good. If this is anything else, 401. And so we're able to uh, make valid requests and make sure that the error handling is right and everything. We then can test the actual token validator as a separate component. And that's where we'll focus more on a unit or an integration test for that particular area. If you do need to test bits of Rat Pack, though, this is where, like in Grails, you're doing a lot with test four that does a lot of uh, setup for you to get all of the wiring done and the mocking. Uh, you need to use things like exec harness and request fixture in Rat Pack to test things that are managed. Uh, exec harness is for managing, testing managed threads of Rat Pack, basically. So, if you have these promises, they expect to be on a rat pack thread. So because of that, we can use the exec harness and dot yield. And so that deals with the blocking for you and everything like that. And then you'll get the data back out of the result. And the exec harness result is pretty interesting because it encapsulates uh, errors and things like that. So it's not like you're going to get uh, like random throws. Uh, the request fixture is another very interesting thing to work with. It's meant to test handlers and handlers alone. So what if you use render uh, and you're using these renderers that like we've seen a little bit of, uh, you don't actually get the output that the user would see. You get something that says, yes, render was called with this type. So all you're really testing with that request fixture is that the handler correctly processed the data and called the right output, not that the right output came out. Once you want to do that, that's when you start. So caching. Super important for every system. And it actually has relatively limited built-in framework support on either side. There is a, a nice uh, Grails caching plugin. Uh, if you structure your code such a way that you can take advantage of this with an annotation, a method can be cached. Uh, we've found that code ended up not being perfectly structured to take advantage of this in certain times where we'll have a little too much logic and want to do certain things based on the cache hits or misses. And so we've tended to drop down to direct control. It only be a direct control. Uh, but you don't want to actually cache a lot of the values. In Rat Pack, you can actually cache the promises themselves. Object. That's assuming if you're doing an in-memory cache, like caffeine or something like that. But while you're doing that, you have to make sure you call this dot cache on the promise, which is a little, this is a little gotcha that I, I Manage to not do. So I cache the promise, and since the promise is lazily evaluated, until something says dot then on it, it doesn't actually ever execute. So I would cache these promises that were ready to execute, and then call then on them. And I was, it didn't feel like I was ever getting cache hit, where all my metrics said I was. And what happened was, since I didn't call dot cache, the val like, what I was caching was the actual ability to go make that asynchronous block non-blocking call, not the actual value from it. By doing dot cache, you'll be able to actually store the real value. There are some current clear, clearly easier paths right now. If you're doing queues and trying to do rat pack, there's nothing out of the box that will help you. And it's relatively hard, in my opinion, to adapt, adopt it to the execution model. Because many of those want to run their own thread pools. They when you try to adapt them, they can tend to throw stack overflows and things like that. So there's, there's a little bit of gotchas there. I actually find it a lot easier to work directly with Grails in this case. But if you're doing Grails and 100% non-blocking, and that's what you're trying to force your team into, I think it's a, it's, you can do that with Grails, but it's a lot more 
pulling in RxJava, pulling in these other modules, and making sure that everyone does it, opposed to Rat Pack just saying, well, the only execution model is an asynchronous non blocking execution model. You into it. If you're using, if you want to use an ORM with Mongo, you should be using Grails with Gorm. It, Gorm for Mongo. It's got great support across the board. Lots of very nice built-in features. It's a great thing to do. So I wanted to open it up for questions. So there's nothing out of the box that would support having a different thread pool per path. Uh, what happens right now in Rat Pack is you have your compute threads and your like blocking I/O threads, and you, the whole goal is to move as fastly as, po as fast as possible through the handlers and move everything to blocking. So if we look at um, in detail the DAO to these, oops, sorry, these blocking git calls. That's built into Rat Pack that basically moves off of the, off of the main thread into your IO thread pool. So there, there's a few thread pools, but it's not really designed to switch per handler, but more on the workload you're actually doing. It's not. It's all built onto Netty. So if you wanted to do that, you'd have to dig deep into Netty, and I would guess you. I don't know why you would need to do that in particular. There's. I think what you'd probably want to do is have something delegate to two separate services, and like have a uh, nginx or something like that actually just hit two different Rat Pack apps, and then you could adjust the thread pools on two running apps and things like that. That, I mean, that's what I would do because then if there's an assumption of having different amounts of threads per like handler chain or, or hubs, you probably want to have different scale characteristics. So running them as separate services allows you to, to kind of grow them and shrink them separately. Yes. <laughs> so... There are performance differences, but it's all about how practical those performance differences are. So, for example, we run a Grails 3 service that serves most of our authentic authentication traffic. And we just tend to auto-scale it and add more boxes, and the maintainability and our ability to make all of that with Spring Security work is okay compared to the number of boxes we have to run. Uh, for our workloads, when we're using Rat Pack, we tend to use Cassandra, and that has a non-blocking driver. So we have a whole lot of like really happy path for Rat Pack, and it uses very little resources. Uh, in general, Rat Pack apps are thinner and basically run on less resources and start up faster because they have so little thing. So so there's like nothing there. <laughs> Uh, there, there's so little there. They don't have Tomcat or Jetty. They don't have a servlet container. Because of that, they're just going to be that much thinner out of the gate. Uh, also, you can make a Grails app very thin, but you're always going to have that servlet container there that has a little bit of, for now until there's the, what, next version has the Netty profile potentially? So. You should use your own benchmarking as well to make sure that on your, your workload, but for us, it's been very performant to run Rat Pack. Yeah, so because Rat Pack wants to manage the execution model, uh, all the promises are Rat Pack promises. Java. So if you want to use observables, you can, but you have to use a, a Rat Pack RX Java module to make sure that they're using the same thread pool. So what is really interesting about Rat Pack promises is that they're deterministic. So since they're, lazy, 
since they're lazy and they're lazily evaluated and serial. So by default, everything is done serially. So you will always get the same deterministic outcome. If at any point you want to do parallel, there's things called parallel batch. So you're explicitly saying, I want these things to happen in parallel, opposed to with a lot of asynchronous work, as soon as you fire it, it's off doing its work, whether or not you're ever re reading a response, which when you first move over and you first try something with Ratpack, that's one gotcha that a lot of people run into is they don't, they're like, okay, I wrote this to the database. I don't really care about the result. I'm not doing a dot then. It will never be executed because Ratpack determines you don't care about the value, so I'm never going to try to compute it. So you can adapt a completable future or completion stage into a promise uh, and a listenable future from Guava. They can all be adapted into uh, a rat pack uh, promise. And then basically they will make sure, like everything kind of like works in the execution then. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's uh, not an official module. It is, it is right up here under Smart Things OSS uh, Ratpack Cassandra. Uh, all it's going to provide is a. It r provides migrate uh, Cassandra migrations uh, to migrate schemas, and it provides the. Wow, this is really slow. Um, <laughs> sorry. It provides a nice interface to adapt everything to promises, as well as adapting everything to uh, observables. So in the case of Cassandra, if you pull back a bunch of rows, you can actually get an observable of the row of the result instead of having a promise to the result set. So that's some work that we've done and that's open source. It's it's on that GitHub that I don't have access to right now for some reason, but uh, it's out there. It is actually linked if you go to ratpack.io into the guide. There is a third-party module section somewhere in there. If Danny remembers the title of that, no. He doesn't remember the title of it either, so <laughs> blame him. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, there, is, there is a... Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Ratpack, there is a uh, rat, intro to Ratpack talk tomorrow, an async uh, programming Ratpack talk that's much more in depth about the execution model, and then there's actually a workshop uh, that's two hours, right? Yeah. There's a two-hour workshop as well on Ratpack. So there's a lot to do with Ratpack. I believe there was a lot of there's a lot of Grails content throughout the conference as well. So if you find one that you're looking for, hopefully that is a little faster. Uh, is that the right time? Thank you. Thank you.